Okay, then, then we can start. <coughs> so this is the third lecture on algebraic topology where we're talking about the homotopy invariance theorem. So um, this was a theorem if um, <coughs> f and g from x to y are homotopic maps Uh, then it follows that they induce the same map on homology. So then F star is equal to G star on Hn of x to Hn of y for all n. So uh, we had first introduced uh, chain homotopies. Maybe I will not... Well, maybe I will repeat it. So um, this was, if we have two chain maps, F star and G star from a certain uh, chain complex C star D to another chain complex uh, D star D, then we said they were uh, chain homotopic if one had some kind of diagonal maps which interpolate between the two. So then F and G are chain homotopic oh, well, if um, there exist um, uh, there are maps S I from uh, Ci to Di plus 1, uh, such that we have that D composed with Si minus S minus 1, Si minus 1 composed with D is equal to Gi minus Fi for all i. So somehow the difference between these two, two can somehow be obtained as having to do with something composed with a differential. And this will uh, serve, <coughs> this serves to prove that uh, this lemma which we proved. If uh, uh, F and G are chain homotopic, then the induced map uh, F star is equal to G star from Hn of C to Hn of D. So then they induce the same uh, map on the homology of the chain complex. Now we wanted to use this to prove the theorem. And I have to repeat the setup I expect. So we uh, go to the proof. So <clears throat> we had first seen that one can reduce to the case uh, enough to show the theorem in case, uh, uh, say, f is equal to E0 and g is equal to E1, where E0 and E1 are the inclusions of X, uh, so E0, X, so no. So X times I, X goes to X comma zero and similar for I1. We had seen that this is enough to prove it in this case. And then we were making this set, set up. So uh, we want to uh, out of a out, out of a simplex, we somehow make a prism and uh, divide it into smaller simplices. So this was the following. So in delta n, so the standard simplex times i, i is always uh, interval zero one. Um, 
we uh, take the kind of endpoints. So we put um, vi equal to ei comma zero. So somehow the ones in the bottom. And uh, wi equal to ei comma one. And uh, so if this one is delta one, then we get basically another copy of delta one here and we have here this, uh, in this case a square, but in general a prism. And uh, <coughs> we define some maps from, uh, given a map from delta n. So if we have a homotopy, we get from this a map from n plus one simplices to, uh, to x as follows. So so first we define, we look at these maps, w0, v0 until vi, wi, until Wn, this by definition is a map from delta n plus one to delta n times i, whose image is just the span of these points. So for instance, it's not easy, it's V0, V1, W0, W1. And so here we would have this thing would be v0, w0, w1. So the image of this map and the image of the map, the second one would be v0, v1, w1. And then using these maps and our homotopy, we can um, Okay, so well, you don't need the homotopy. Using our map, we can define a map, uh, we can define this prism operator. So let's just write it down. If we have, uh, so we want to first define it on simplices. So one, we want to define an operator, P, from uh, Cn of x to Cn plus one of x times i, which in the end is supposed to give us uh, a chain homotopy uh, uh, between uh, i0 and i1, okay? But we first have, and so at least it goes in the correct way. It goes kind of diagonally. Um, and we do this first for a simplex. Uh, we define it by this formula. We just use all of these, compose it with sigma times the identity on i, and take the alternating sum. So this is sum i equals zero to n minus one to the i sigma composed with the identity on i v zero the i w i until w n. Okay. Yes, indeed, it is cross. It's, it is a misprint in the notes, which now I copied. Here it is the composition. Um, <clears throat> so we just have, so this is a map from delta n plus one to x times i, and then we compose it with the identity on i times the map sigma. So this is a well-defined thing. And we put these signs as usual so that in the end something will cancel. And then for 
this is just for a singular simplex, then in general case, we do it by linearity. So for alpha, so for we make P of some over simply C's A sigma times sigma. So this is an integer. This is a singular simplex. Uh, we define this as usual to be the sum over all sigma A sigma times P of sigma. So always bilinearity. So then we have defined this, uh, this map, which is a homomorphism between these two abelian groups. And we want to show uh, P is a chain homotopy um, between uh, the maps induced by I0 and I1. Um, from I0 lower star to I1 lower star, where, you know, I, I zero lower star is just a map from um, uh, the chain complex C star of X to C star of X times I, which is obtained in the usual way by composing with I zero. So, so some A sigma, A sigma, A sigma times sigma is mapped to sum over all sigma, A sigma, times I0 of sigma. I0 composed with sigma. No, that's how uh, this was, the, this induced map on the level of change was done. We just take the map to x and we compose it with the I0 into x times I. Okay, and we want to, sh and the same obviously for I1. <coughs> And so now we want to prove that this is indeed the case. And you know, so I mean, in some sense, uh, this is it. So the, the proof uh, is difficult because you have to come up with the idea of using this. Now the rest is you just compute and it's either true or false. And if it's true, then you have proven it. So. How do we prove it? So we just, so what I kind of, so what does it mean that it's a chain homotopy? It means that D P minus um, P D, you know, always in the correct degrees. So I could call this, maybe I call this P N. Um, Uh, should be equal to I0 star minus I1 star or the other around. It doesn't matter. So that's what we have to show. So we just compute what we have here. So it's enough to show this on simply C's, obviously. So if, uh, so let sigma from delta N to uh, X, here, yeah, singular simplex. Then by linearity, it's enough to show that if we apply this thing to sigma, then we get this. Okay, so let's compute. What is dP sigma? Now no, I forget the N because there's... Well, we just have to, you know, we know the definition of D and we know the definition of P, so we just write it out. So this is D of uh, sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 to the i uh, sigma times the identity on i v0 v i w i w n. And you recall 
the definition of P, which is again an alternating sum where one, uh, you know, removes the, uh, the i'th of it and takes this also, or the j'th of the things which are written here and multiplies it by minus one to the j. It takes the alternating sum. So this is sum. Um, and now there are obviously, you know, either one is among the first or one is among the last. So we distinguish these cases. So this is first the sum j is smaller than i. Do we want this one first? Then it's the sum j is bigger, equal to i. Um, so minus one, minus one to the i, minus one to the j, uh, sigma times the identity on i, v0, forget vj, okay. And then if um, we are, so this is for the first here. Now, if uh, the number is bigger so that we get to the last one, so one has to remember that this one is actually the not the i plus first. This one is the i plus first, is the i plus second. So it has an extra sign if one makes the alternating sum. So this is minus one to the i, minus one to the j plus one, sigma times one i, e zero, e i, w i, w j, w n. Because the sign, you take minus one, to the uh, which, you know, at which point in this list it is, starting with zero. So this is the jth one, but this is the j plus, j plus first. Because first we go until i, and then we go on with i again. Okay, so this is what it is. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is a, my this is the notation which I use, but maybe it's a bit too much of a shorthand. I sum with respect both to i and j, so maybe I should say it, write it better. Although you know it is also standard, so it's sum i equal zero to n, sum j smaller equal to i, and sum i equal zero to n, sum j bigger equal to i. So it's a double sum. No? And before I meant, just wrote just this, and I meant I'm summing over both. But uh, you know, that's maybe. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we just note the terms uh, with j equal to i are more or less the same. So if j is equal to i, then, uh, you know, it just means we don't, you know, we don't have this twice the same thing because we leave out one of them. So if, uh, you know, if you have j equal to i here, we throw away the, the first one. If you have j equal to i here, we throw away the second one, but the effect is the same. You know, the, you know, the, uh, we just get the elements from, uh, that we have, and uh, there's no doubling. But it's not, so they cancel, and uh, so the, these essentially all occur in both sums, but we see that the, the sign is different, so they will cancel. But it's not completely that they cancel, because we have, <coughs> so they, they cancel, except for two terms. Namely, the case when i is equal to j is equal to zero here, <coughs> then, you know, here we, um, when i is equal to j equal to zero, then in the first sum we have just, uh, you know, from w zero to w n. And the second uh, sum, we have the sum from v0, then uh, w1 to wn. It's not the same thing. 
So, <clears throat> so um, and so one of one of them occurs in the second, the other one doesn't. So only one of them survives. So the the thing which does not cancel here is in the case i equal j equal to n or i equal j equal to zero or equal to n. And I claim that the only thing that survives is the following two terms. Um, sigma times the identity composed with uh, w0 to wn minus sigma times the identity composed with um, what now of oh. and I'm quite, quite sure I got it right ah so I think I have to see, uh, yeah. So yeah, and then the other one is V0. Yeah. So because all the other ones that we get here occur twice, once here and once here. But uh, uh, this one, uh, Uh, this one here will not occur in the uh, in the second sum because we always start with v0 in the second sum. And this one here will not uh, will not be in the first sum because the first sum every element starts with wn stops with wn. So these are the only ones which don't cancel, but all the other ones it's always uh, it comes once here and once here and with opposite signs. And so the only, this whole, the sum, the, the terms here with i equal to j are only those. Okay. Why do I care about this? Well, we want to compute the difference. So I claim that if I do it the other way around, I get only the terms where i is different from j. So let's see where this, why this would be true. On the other hand, if I take um, p d sigma, well, then we do the same thing. First, we uh, apply uh, d. So this is um, so. Here, sigma is just, uh, is, so this will be as follows. We have p of um, sum j uh, from 0 to n of uh, minus 1 to the j, sigma composed with e0, ej. So this was how the map was defined. You now we have this, this simplex, sigma, which is a map from uh, delta n to this. And this is the, the composition with these phase maps it gives us the, this thing. And we take p of that. And now we have to do the p. So the p is linear, so we have to apply it to each of them. And we do the same thing. We, you know, we just, uh, so <clears throat> how does it go? So there are two possibilities. So, so I claim I can write it follows. This is sum uh, uh, i equal 0 to n uh, minus 1 to the i. Um, so 
So now we replace the sigma. So we also have this. Um, so first we assume again the case that j is now smaller than i. You know, obviously, <clears throat> OK, so let's see. So we take um, v0, vj, vi, wi, wn. So we take whatever we have, and we you know, double, you know, put uh, uh, in the ith position, uh, we put one up and the other one we leave down. No, this is what it is. And I forgot, obviously, the whole thing that was written here. This was um, minus 1 to the i, sum j equals 0 to n, minus 1 to the j, sigma times the identity on i composed with this. And then, so and this is not the, so I wanted to have j smaller than i. And now, so j is the one we leave out. So <clears throat> obviously, now j cannot be equal to i because, you know, i is the one we double. We cannot double the thing which is not there. So this is plus sum i equals 0 to n, sum j is bigger than i. Uh, so you have again minus 1 to the i. And we have again to see that, <clears throat> so we have, um, we have to think about the sign anyway, but to this we can do in a moment, sigma times the identity, v0, vi, wi, and we leave out the wj until wn. And so, what about the sign? So, you know, you see that now we have not left out the jth one, but the jth plus first again, because this one is doubled. So, this is minus one, so the j plus one. And so, if you look at this, this is the same sum, this is the same thing here as what is written here, except that we don't have the term j is equal to i. So, we see that. The difference between these two is precisely the terms with j equal to i, which is this. So, so we see this is, is the same as um, dp sigma, except for the terms with j equals to i, which are only in the first sum and not in the second. And so uh, this improves. So maybe this is what we want to prove. We can leave it there. Or with the opposite sign, it does not matter. So this proves that this thing, deep dpn of sigma minus minus pn minus 1 d sigma is equal to this uh, minus sigma times the identity V0, the n. And now you have to just remember how this goes. So, I mean, how everything was, was defined. So, um, so we had this thing that we have uh, here. So we have that W. So vi is equal to uh, ei, zero, and wi 
is equal to EI comma 1. So thus it follows. So, so this thing here is just the, you know, the image, you know, just this thing is just the map. So W0, Un is just um, uh, the map um, E1, E0 to En. So the in, you know, this is in delta n times i. So the point one here, and just this is just the identity. And uh, so this is just uh, the identity. So in other words, this is identity of delta n times one. And uh, the other one, v zero is just the identity of delta n times 0. So every point gets mapped to itself times 1, here times 0. And so <clears throat> in other words, this is, um, is equal to, um, so therefore, this map sigma times the identity of i composed with w0 to wn is equal to i1 composed with sigma. No, that's what it says. <coughs> and uh, in the same way, Well, and so, and you know, the map, <clears throat> so thus we see that in this difference is equal to I1 composed with sigma minus I0 composed with sigma, so the sign is precisely the other round, which is the same as, by definition, as I1 lower star of sigma minus I zero lower star of sigma. So we have shown that on simplices, this formula holds, and everything is linear, so it holds in general. So thus, P is a chain homotopy uh, from whatever, either E zero to a one or E one to E zero, so E one lower star to E. Zero no star. And so therefore, by the previous theorem, then E1 lower star and E0 lower star induce the same map on homology. And uh, uh, <coughs> therefore, by the kind of uh, case that one could reduce to this, it follows that homotopic maps induce the same map on homology. OK, so this was a slightly tricky proof. And uh, you should maybe, you know, the. The combinatorics of this sum is maybe also something one has to study with some, uh, you know, take a little bit of time to digest. But at any rate, <coughs> uh, it is not particularly difficult. It's just many uh, little steps, and you have to always know where you are. But uh, this kind of trick of making this, uh, you know, all these uh, n plus 1 simplices out of the n simplex in this way. This is uh, actually quite uh, difficult, I mean, you know, to think of something like that. So <clears throat> now we have learned that if you have two homotopic maps between topological spaces, they give the same map on uh, homology. So then we can also ask ourselves, I mean, in what, what kind of other relations are there between uh, homology and homotopy? For instance, you know, we have this other invariant, which is the fundamental group. So how is it related to the homology? And this we want to briefly investigate now. 
it's um, <coughs> I will not uh, completely I will uh, prove a little bit about it and state the precise result but I will not prove it completely because it's too long but at least I will uh, uh, I mean I will not miss out anything which is difficult so relation between uh, fundamental group and homology. So, as before, I will briefly recall the definition of the fundamental group, although you just had it, but so we fix notations. So let X it be a topological space. Um, and we fix the base point x0 in x. So a loop, a loop in x at x0 is a map from the interval 0, 1, which uh, into x, continuous map, which at both endpoints maps it to x0. So is a map, is a continuous map. Um, say sigma from 0, 1 to x uh, with sigma of 0 is equal to sigma of 1 is equal to x0. So we have our space, we have our point x0, and the loop is somehow, you know, a loop. Um, <clears throat> so and uh, then uh, the fundamental group is about uh, homotopy classes of loops. So two loops uh, at x0. Anyway, uh, maybe I call them sigma and tau from 0, 1 to x are homotopic. So not when they are homotopy, non not when they are homotopic, homotopic just as mapped to x, but also fixing x0, as you know. So if there is a, so they are called homotopic, if there is a continuous map maybe f from the product of these intervals, so Interval was also called i, after all, from i times i to uh, x, such that if, if I take f, restrict it to, say, which we want to want it, maybe i times 0 is equal to sigma, f restricted to i times 1 is equal to tau, and in addition, at all times, the point x0 is fixed, so f restricted to 0 times i is equal to x0. I mean by this, it's the constant map which sends everything to x0. And uh, f restricted to 1 times i is also equal to x0. So this is this homotopy. So if you want to make some kind of picture, we have uh, this product of these two intervals, i times i, have the you know, 0, 1, the 1 here. And we have that, say, here, uh, the map is sigma in the bottom, in the top, the map is tau. This one goes from here to here. Here it's all the time x0, and here it's all the time also x0. And this makes sense because, after all, the both endpoints here are mapped also to x0. Okay. And we also had some, there was some composition of loops.
So if sigma from 0, 1 to x and tau 0, 1 to x are uh, loops at x, loops at x0, then we can define the composition. Uh, maybe sigma composed with tau, so I make this as a star. I don't know what the standard notation for u is. This is again a loop um, where we just run through one after, after the other and we reparameterize so that uh, we get along from zero to one. So for instance, uh, uh, we say t is mapped to uh, tau of twice t if uh, t is smaller than one half and uh, sigma of twice t minus one if it is on the other in the other half of the interval and you know as uh, at the end point here one gets always to x zero this matches and gives us a continuous map <laughs> one just does one after the other and reparameterizes and uh, so the, the equivalence classes of loops at x0 in x form a group under homotopy So we have this homotopy of loops. We look at the equivalence classes, form a group. P1 of x, x0, the fundamental group. And, um, you know, the, if I write the equivalence classes, for instance, so I write something like that. Gamma is the equivalence class of gamma. Then uh, the group structure is just that if I take gamma times tau is defined to be gamma composed with tau. Okay, so this was how this was defined, and this is a group. In general, it will be a non-commutative group. So now we want to relate this to homology. And the reason why this will be related to homology, in fact, to the first homology group is that after all, this i, the interval 0, 1, is just the standard one simplex. So a loop in X is a singular one simplex in X. So therefore we have somehow an obvious, we have obvious maps which relate them. And then we have to see what these maps do. So note, by our definition, delta one is just the interval zero one. Thus, a loop in X at X0 or whatever is a singular one simplex in X. And there's more. So we have a loop, say, at X0. Maybe I call it gamma. So gamma is a map from 0, 1 to x with gamma of 0 is equal to gamma of 1 equal to x0. And <clears throat> now, what is it if we take the differential of gamma as a, once, as a one chain? So then d gamma is, if you remember, the endpoint viewed as a constant map, uh, the beginning point, no, 
the end point minus the beginning point. So this is gamma 1 minus gamma 0, which means x0 minus x0 to, to 0. So in this case, I didn't have to remember who was first because they're equal, but uh, still one should. So thus, gamma is a, a <coughs> you know, is a cycle, C1 of x. It's a one cycle. So as it's a one cycle, we can uh, compute its, um, we, we can define its homology class. It's just the equivalence class modulo boundaries. So we have a map. Uh, which I maybe call chi, from the set of loops in x at x0 to the first homology group of x, which sends gamma to its class in homology. No? Modulo uh, boundaries. And we want to, <clears throat> and so we basically have the same space. We have the loops. Certain equivalence classes of loops give us the fundamental group with respect to a certain equivalence relation. And with respect to another equivalence relation, it gives us uh, the first homology. Now we want to see how these two equivalence relations are related so to see how the groups are related. And uh, also somehow, the group structure should be related. And this is the subject of the following proposition. So if gamma, so there's two parts. If, say, gamma and tau are homotopic loops in x0, in x at x0, so we have two loops at x0 which are homotopic as loops, then it follows that they define the same homology class. Okay? And the second statement is that this is also compatible so this means, in other words, uh, you know, note this means we have a map from pi 1 of x, x0 to h1 of x, a well-defined map, by sending the class of a loop to the class of a loop as a singular one chain. No, because we know that uh, if they are in the same class, they are also in the same class here. And the second statement is that it's compatible with the group structure. So if, uh, uh, again, so maybe gamma tau again loops uh, then if I take the class of the composition, this is the class of gamma plus the class of tau. So in other words, it means if we put these two together, it means we get a homomorphism from P1 to H1 of X, a homomorphism of groups. So there is a homomorphism from the fundamental group to H1 of X. So I want to prove this proposition. And then I will just state what precisely is true. Because you would want to know, you have a homomorphism. Is the homomorphism uh, injective? Is it surjective? What is the kernel? No? And that uh, I will state afterwards. But first, I just have this. 
So we have, so in other words, I say it again, chi from P1 of x, x0 to H1 of x. Uh, gamma maps to gamma is a group homomorphism. Okay, so and the proof is somewhat similar to this uh, homotopy invariance theorem, a little bit simpler. So we have two parts. So assume we have a homotopy between these two. Okay, so now these two change miraculously that names into sigma and tau, and then, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. So let f from i times e, i, to um, x be a homotopy. So this means that um, f restricted to uh, i times 0 is a um, uh, see, yeah, no, I don't know which one I want first. <coughs> Gamma, oh, how are they called? Yeah. Um, F restricted to I times one is tau, and uh, F restricted to zero times i is equal to x0, and this is also true for f restricted to 1 times i. Okay, so this was this thing. Um, and we do the same thing as we did uh, for the homotopy invariance. We, again, make a map from other simplices in the same way. So we have, uh, we define V0 equal to 0, 1, 1 equal to, no, 0, 0, 0, 1. I hope I get it right. Ah. Yeah, anyway, so that, so, I'm not quite sure whether I might have exchanged these two factors, but I think you can manage that. So W0 equal to 1, 0, W1 equal to 1, 1. So we have this square I times I. We have V0, V1, W0, W1. And we have this map F which somehow maps from this to x. And if I restrict it to the bottom, if I'm lucky, and I think this precisely means I always have to ex exchange these, then I get uh, sigma, actually gamma. If I restrict it to the top, I get tau. And here's the constant map x0, and here's the constant map x0. And then we subdivide this thing in the same way as, uh, you know, as for the homotopy invariance theorem. So we define a two chain. Um, say alpha in uh, C2 of X by, um, you know, alpha is equal to F composed with V0, W0, W1, minus F composed with V0, V1, W1. So this means we have, um, so the map which maps the standard simplex first on this half is this, you know, is this map. The map which maps the standard simplex on this half is this map, and we take this one with plus, and so we take this one with plus, this one with minus, and we apply F to it, and this gives us a two chain. 
So this is our two chain, and we want to claim, obviously, that uh, you know we want to claim that two things are homologous. So we want to show that the difference between the two, uh, these two, is precisely uh, whatever tau minus gamma or the other around. And it's kind of obvious that this will be the case because the thing in the middle cancels out, and here it's it's x zero constant that will also cancel out. So we write it down. So what is the alpha? Uh, where do I want to do this now? So this I wipe out because anyway then. <coughs> so what is it, the alpha? This is, um, you know, how does one do d? One leaves out the ith one and takes it with minus one to the i, where i starts with zero. So the first one is, so here we have this one. So you have f composed with w0, w1, minus f composed with, I leave out the w0, v0, w1, plus f composed with uh, v0, w0, and then minus, and so we have, a, so the whole thing minus, because we have a minus here, so we get a plus here and a minus here, and then we do the same thing here. So f composed with v1, w1, f composed with v0, w1, uh, f composed with v0, v1, okay? So these two cancel. And um, the, what else do we have? This one here is this, v0, uh, w0, w1, so this is tau. So this composition, f composed with this is tau. This map, we are here on this side, is the constant map x0. Here we have uh, v1w1, that is x0. And here we have v0, v1, that is gamma. So we see that indeed the difference of tau and gamma is a boundary, namely that of alpha. So we find tau is equal to gamma. So this proves the first part. In the second part, I will do slightly more in a slightly more hand-waving way. I just draw you a picture and you would have to uh, turn this into a formula to show that the picture describes something continuous. So we have to find, you know, we want to prove that these two classes are, that the class of this and the class are equal. So we have to find, again, a singular two chain whose boundary is the difference between these. And we do this actually, this is actually given by just one simplex. So let, say, sigma from delta 2 to x be given as follows. And I will now just um, write it. So we take our simplex, I write it in the, uh, you know, it's, I, draw it in this way, although the angles are maybe not correct. So I, this one is E0, E1, E2. So this is a two simplex. And now I want, on this part, I want the map to be tau. So the map from here, so I have a, a map from here to x. And on this part, the map should be tau. 
No? If I, you know, just, you know, this is an, basically interval zero, one, the map should be tau. On this, it should be gamma. And then I draw a line here. And I just, you know, whenever I have a line here connected like this, like this, then, I hope it's the correct way around. I will find out that's precisely the wrong way around, but anyway. <clears throat> so maybe I call this gamma and this tau. I mean, this will not make a difference. So the tau, after all, comes first. So then on this part, it should be tau again reparameterized. So if you take the map from the interval to here, which goes from here linearly, then composed with the map here, it should be tau. And here, it should be gamma. And this always for all these lines, always until the corner. Okay, so I hope you understand what I mean. So here we take you know, a map from the interval 0, 1 to this line and compose with map to x, then this composition should be tau. If we take instead this line until this middle line here, then the composition of a kind of linear map from here to here with x again should be tau, and on the other hand for the, this part should be gamma. And then we compose this here by having here just tau, uh, gamma, tau. Okay, so you can somehow see that you know, if you just take this composition here, you can really see that this is essentially gamma composed with tau. You know? And just make a picture, okay? So, and then obviously you see, then if I take, what is d sigma? This is uh, the map which you obtain by leaving out a zero. This is gamma. The one which you get by leaving out a one minus gamma tau plus tau. So it follows that Okay. So obviously, so the exercise, so to turn this into a proof, you have to write down a formula for this. So as to show that in this way, I have defined a continuous map. So, so for, um, uh, for sigma, uh, so as to see, it is continuous. And that's, you know, that's kind of trivial. You just have to look at this picture and see what you have to do. And then this proves it. But anyway, here I, I didn't want to do the details. It's obviously often with homotopies that, you know, if you actually want to write down a formula, it gets a bit complicated. But I think, I mean, I hope you can imagine what I mean. No? I don't know. You look, uh, I cannot know. I mean, I just say it and nobody says either yes or no. So, um, so what I just mean, I have here, I have the map sigma. If I restrict sigma, so I have a map here from so I have a map, one map from the standard interval to this. For instance, if I have the, if I just take the map from a standard interval to this, which just maps this, which just maps in the obvious way from this zero, this one, and then compose it with sigma, then I get tau. If I do it here, again, starting with E1 to E2, then the composition with sigma is gamma. And here, I do it in such a way, the map from E0 E1, I take the standard interval here, the composition with sigma is this. And then I say I can extend this to a continuous map on the whole thing by always saying that the map, which is the composition of the embedding of the standard interval into this uh, here, into this part, 
if the composition of the standard, the, inter, in, the embedding here with gamma, with sigma should be tau, and here it should be gamma. And I claim, and I do this for every such. No? I have the whole thing is exhausted by these. And this gives us, the claim is this is a continuous map from this whole uh, triangle to x. And it's kind of obvious, I mean, that it should be so. But obviously, to prove it, you have to write down a formula. If you can write down a formula which uh, is everywhere defined and continuous, then it is a continuous map. OK, this proves this proposition. So, and then I want to just state what the result is. Um, so, without proof, so the precise relation between fundamental group and H1. So you can see we have this map, chi from P1 of x, x0 to H1 of x is a group homomorphism. Um, so you know, in best case, you could hope that they are isomorphic. But uh, this can, in general, not be the case because you know that H1 of x is commutative. And uh, P1 of x, x0, does not need to be commutative. So <clears throat> that means that if you have a commutator of elements, it always lies in the kernel of this map. So if you write down something, uh, so if you put k to be the subgroup generated by alpha, beta, alpha to the minus 1, beta to the minus 1, so the, where alpha and beta are elements in P1 of x, x0. So this, is, uh, so this is the subgroup generated by all such elements. So this subgroup is the commutator subgroup. Then because this group is uh, uh, abelian, it follows that all elements in K will lie in the kernel of this map. Because, you know, if you, you know, they are just mapped to A, the image of A plus the image of B minus the image of A minus the image of B, of beta. No? So then, clearly, uh, K is contained in the kernel of, of this chi. And the theorem is, Um, that indeed k is precisely the kernel and the map is surjective. So chi is surjective <coughs> and k is equal to the kernel of chi. So thus uh, we have that h1 of x is isomorphic to the fundamental group of x uh, maybe I should make some assumptions. Yeah. Anyway, divided by k. And, uh, you know, obviously the fundamental group does not work so wonderfully if the space is not path connected. So we assume um, x is path connected. So then the statement is this. And so you could also say, so often sometimes you say that if you take a non-commutative group and you divide it by, by the commutator subgroup, you, you get the abelianized version of the group. Because you throw, you know, you get the biggest quotient, which is abelian. 
you know, you throw away everything. So the uh, first homology group is obtained from the fundamental group by, you know, making it abelian. Okay, so this is this result. So <clears throat> the proof is not very difficult. You know, you just have to, you know, you know, it's similar to what we did here. So for, for every uh, uh, thing in, in H1, you have to somehow construct a, a path which maps to it. And that's, uh, you know, a, a, a loop which maps to it, that's not very difficult. And it's a bit more, it's not particularly difficult, but a little bit lengthy to see that the kernel of the map precisely consists of those. You can see that this requires making some nice, uh, uh, you know, some nice two chains of which uh, you get that the difference has to be the boundary and so on. So that might be a little bit complicated, but it's all quite simple and you can find it in the books. And <clears throat> at any rate, uh, I you know, just wanted to state what the real result is. So uh, as a, so in particular, for instance, we get that um, the first homology of S1, so S1 is the one sphere, no? <clears throat> so um, the first homology of that thing is equal to Z, because we know that the fundamental group is Z, and if we abelianize it, it doesn't change anything. And we have that H1 of Sn, Sn is the n-sphere, is equal to, uh, to 0 if n is bigger than 0. And as we already know, to Z if n is equal, bigger than 1, is equal to 1. Okay. Okay, so because again, we know that the fundamental group of this thing is zero if n is bigger than zero. Okay, so this was as much as I wanted to say about this topic. Now I want to, uh, so this uh, was slightly more concrete than uh, what we had before. Now again, we become a little bit more abstract. So we want to introduce relative homology. So if you have a topological space and a subspace, you have uh, the homology of the topological space, the homology of the subspace, and there's actually something which kind of is in between these two, which is relative homology. And we will prove that they are connected by uh, something which is called the long exact homology sequence. And for that, we will need, uh, again, some homological algebra. First, I introduce the thing, and then we will go to this homological algebra, which is a, what? No. <coughs> OK, so let's see. So we want to talk about relative homology and the long exact ah I actually didn't give you the notes no uh, anyway homology sequence so after these lectures I will or maybe tomorrow if I don't manage I will give you uh, I mean, the continuation of the notes So let X be a topological space. And A in X be a subspace. So that means it's a carries the induced topology. We define the relative homology. So there's a definition. So we have to define some chain complex. So if we look at the chain complex Cn of A, so these are maps from the n simplices into A, 
this is in a natural way contained in Cn of x. This is just, you know, the maps from the, you know, the linear combinations of maps from simplices to x, which happen to map into a. So Cn of a is equal to the set of all sum sigma a sigma times sigma in Cn of x, such that uh, sigma of delta n is contained in A for all, for all sigma. I mean, for all sigma that we have here. Okay. And we also see that if we look at the map D that we have here, if we have D from Cn of x to Cn minus 1 of x, if we have a chain which happens to lie in A, so that the map actually goes to A, all these maps go to A instead of uh, to the bigger space X, then obviously the D of it, which is just the restriction to some faces, will also map to A. So maps um, Cn of A to Cn of A, to Cn minus 1 of A. So in some sense, so we have this chain complex and C, Cn of x with the d's and, Cn, and we have another chain complex and this is really in some sense a sub-complex. So we can see it as follows. We say we define uh, Cn of x a to be the quotient. No, we know that um, Cn of A is contained in Cn of X. We can take the quotient uh, group. And <coughs> as the D here maps Cn of A to Cn minus 1 of A, we get an induced map D on the quotient. So, so, so if I write for the moment, say, alpha for the class uh, for the class of this in this quotient, uh, then we can define D from Cn of x a to Cn minus 1 of x a by sending the class of alpha to, I mean, modulo Cn of A, to the class of D alpha modulo Cn minus 1 of A. No? So we get a chain, and obviously D composed with D is zero because decomposed with zero was decomposed with d was zero to begin with. It certainly doesn't become more by taking the quotient by something. You know, we take after the claw the close the so the the class of decomposed with d here is you know obtained by taking decomposed with d applied to some alpha and that's already zero and if we take a class of it it stays zero. So thus, uh, Cn of xA, so I say C star of xA uh, with D is a chain complex. And uh, the relative homology is just the homology of this thing. So denote don't know whether I need this, well, whatever, Zn of xA to be the kernel of D from Cn of xA to Cn minus 1 of xA. And um, so these are the cycles, relative cycles. And 
and bn of xa is defined to be the image of d from c n plus 1 of x a to c n of x a. These are the relative boundaries. And then the homology is, as usual, the cycles divided by the boundaries. So the Uh, the nth relative homology of x a is h n of x a, which is defined to be uh, a quotient. So that was uh, rather simple and uh, relatively uh, formal. So <coughs> actually, I, but uh, now we want to see how this is related to the usual homology of x and of a. And this is by means of some exact sequences. So I want to show. that the h i of x, h i of a, and h i of x a are closely related, you know, are related um, well, by a long exact sequence. I have to tell you what that is. Roughly it says, is not quite true. What this will imply is that if you know two of them, you know the third. Um, or uh, if you know two of them, you know the third. But in a somewhat intricate way. And so let's see what this is. So I, you know, I talk about this long exact sequence. So as I do not assume that you know what exact sequences are, I have to review this first. And then I have to set up the homological algebra to, yes? What? You know, I have defined, you know, this was a definition, no? I just said that uh, Zn of Xa was defined to be the kernel of uh, uh, D from Cn of Xa to Cn minus 1 of Xa. So, and I had called in the setting where we don't have these two things but just one, we had called this Zn and I had called them cycles. And now if I have the pair of x and a, I say it's relative homology, I say it's relative cycles and it's relative boundaries. But this is you know, just the definition. You know, this is the name how I want to call it. But so. What? Yes. Okay, so you uh, wanted to know what uh, n cycles and n boundaries are, so I maybe can briefly review this. So, you know, you remember we had defined these groups Cn of x, which were, you know, some sigma, uh, a sigma times sigma, where a sigma is in z and sigma is a map from delta n to x. 
And the n refers to the dimension of the insimplex from which we map. And this we call n chains. Now we have a map d from cn of x to cn minus 1 of x. Okay. And so we call zn of x to be the kernel of d. So this is some subgroup of cn of x. Okay, so these are also n chains, so therefore I call them n something, and I call them cycles. I mean, this is just the word that people call them. You know, such things, the kernel of D is called cycles, and as they are n chains, I call them n cycles. This is No, the, con the property that it has to satisfy to be called an n cycle or an n boundary is that it is a cycle or a boundary. So a cycle means that it's in the kernel of D, and that's it. And a boundary means that it's the image of D, of B. So Bn of x, so this is, these are called n cycles. So Zn of x is the group of n cycles. And it's just defined like this. It's the kernel of D and nothing more. And Bn of x is the image of D. This is also a subgroup of the same n chains. And you know, it is called the group of boundaries. This is again just a name that people give to it. I mean, it's not a name that I invented. And uh, now we know that d composed with d is equal to 0. So it follows from this that bn of x is contained in zn of x. And so therefore, we can take the quotient, which is the homology. Okay, so this is, but you know, to this with the cycles and the boundaries, these are just words. You know, you just call it like this. It's uh, for some reason. Do you have any example, definitely example of uh, making like, like this one? What? Have example, for example, uh, instead of x, you can choose some expression there. Yes, uh, I am. Yeah. So how do you define the operation of it to make it a group? No, no, oh. Oh, I mean, this I said the other time. Uh, this I said the first time, but you, you could have asked then, but now I. Uh, so you see, these are formal expressions. So therefore, I can take the formal sum. You know, it's just, you see, I mean, obviously, this you have to know, otherwise, it. Uh, cannot do anything at all. <clears throat> so, so you have an element. So if you have an, a class alpha in Cn of x, then alpha can be written as sum A sigma times sigma. So sigma and where, where, where sigma runs through, so each sigma is a map from delta n to x, but it's for different ones. So you just have this that you have a certain finite number. So you have to each map from delta n to x, to each continuous map from delta n to x, you so associate an integer. A n, A sigma, is an integer. So in such a way that only finitely many of these integers are non-zero. Because if you write sum, you always mean that the sum is finite. OK? So you have for finitely many of these maps, you associate an integer. But you, you view this in such a way that you associate an integer to every simplex, and for most of them, the, the number you associate is 0. No, that's a simpler way of seeing it. Because then you can sum it very easily. If you, have, if you have sum sigma, alpha sigma times sigma, 
plus some sigma beta sigma times sigma, how do you sum them? Well, like you would sum if these were really sums of things, you just sum the coefficients. This is defined to be the sum over all sigma, a sigma plus beta b sigma times sigma. Um, so let's look at the, so we can, uh, and the difference is, you know, you can also take minus, so this is the sum in the group. And the way of doing, so the standard way how you would call this construction is you'd have, this is the free abelian group generated by these singular simplices. You just take the, um, and the minus the element, the additive inverse, you can easily see. So minus of some sigma, a sigma times sigma, obviously is uh, sum over all sigma minus a sigma times sigma. So let's look at a very small example, you know, just to make sure. So, you know, obviously if you look at a real topological space, I mean some, you know, of real life, then it will have uh, very many points and there will be very many uh, maps from delta n to x. So the, the set of the sigma over which you sum is huge. It's some un uncountable set. But you only take finite sums. So it's not, uh, you know, there are only finitely many coefficients non-zero. But let's look at a very small case. So assume that x is equal to the set of two points. Oh, say it's called, uh, it consists of a point x and a point y. So this is a small case, okay? So in that case, so <coughs> what are, uh, so if I want to look at, you know, what is Cn of x? So, you know, uh, delta n is connected. So, you know, here we have a, you know, these are is supposed to be a discrete set of two points. So it means that, uh, you know, delta n can only map to x or it can map to y. So that means what? So we have two maps. We have the map from delta n which to, to x, the constant map, which I could call, well, maybe I call it x underlined, so which maps delta n constant to x. So every point of delta n goes to x, and we have y underlined, which is the map delta n to y. So every point t is mapped to x, and here t is mapped to y. So what is then cn of x? Well, this is the sum. This is so, is the set of all uh, uh, formal sums. Um, we have a times x plus b times y, where a and b are integers. That's what it is. No? And uh, so it is just and the addition is the usual one. You all just add the coefficients. So this is isomorphic to z, z squared. Okay. But obviously, if you take something like Rn and you want to say concretely what this is, you know, this is some, you know, some uh, abelian group which has uh, uncountably many generators. So you know, it's not so easy to write concretely what it is then. I mean, the miracle is that if you do the, the homology, so you take this thing, you take the, the D, and then you, you take the kernel of the D divided by the image of D, you usually get some finitely generated abelian group, at least if you have a reasonable space. So, so you know, as we, for instance, saw that if the space is connected, then H0 is equal to Z. This is, you know, quite miraculous if you think what a big thing you take of which you take a quotient. So you take something huge and you divide it by something as huge and it turns out that the quotient is very small and also still interesting. Anyway, so that's uh, what we have there. So I hope this is a bit clearer then. Okay, thank you. So next time we talk about relative homology. <laughs>